Ellie is one of the prominent innovation experts in Asia Pacific with over 30 years of work experience in a variety of business and marketing roles. The last 10 years, he has extensively worked on innovation management and consulting. Currently, he's the founder at Northern Star Innovation, and some of his marquee clients include Ernest & Young, Merck, Intel, Hero Motors. In fact, Ellie advised and mentored Hero Motors to create the Hero Hatch incubation program. He, led, uh, he, he was invited to lead the ideation and early prototyping process for Hero Hatch. The program eventually enabled Hero to prepare future generation of innovation leaders and developing the roadmap for innovative products and services for their customers. Eventually, this engagement resulted in two operating companies for Hero. Prior to this, uh, Ellie was the organization innovation head at Amdocs, a software and managed services provider. Uh, Ellie is based in Sydney, Australia. Ellie, thank you so much for giving us your time today and hosting this session for our viewers. It's a pleasure to have you. Please thank you. Thank you so much, Gaurav, for, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and be part of this uh, masterclass program of great learning. Um, and uh, I think it's wonderful to see the, the, the work you're doing in providing these, uh, these, these classes uh, to people at this difficult time. So congratulations for that. Um, it, is a, it is a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, as Gaurav said, my background is in innovation management. Um, I am coming to you from Sydney, Australia. So good day from Australia. If uh, you haven't been here, hopefully after the COVID crisis is over and we can all fly again, uh, you'll come for a visit. We, we, we look forward to seeing you here in Australia. Um, before we start with anything like agenda and introductions, I want us to go straight into a little quiz. And this quiz is very much connected to the concept in strategic inventive thinking uh, that we're looking at today. And this concept is to do with breaking fixedness. So I'm gonna ask you to imagine for a moment that you have a different job to the one that you have. I'm gonna promote you uh, or, or, or maybe keep you on your same level if you are already a CEO, but I'm gonna ask you to think of yourself as the CEO of the Chinese, uh, uh, China's railway company. And your job is as follows. You need to find a way to reduce the time it takes for the trans-China train to travel the thousands of miles, it's about five to 6,000 miles from one end of China to another. And the restrictions are that you can't change the path. So the path is set, the railway track is set. Um, you need to get to your destination faster. And you need to do it in such a way that still uh, uh, takes on the same number of passengers and releases the same number of passengers at the station. So with those restrictions in mind, could I see some suggestions about how you could reduce the time? So, so I'll repeat the challenge. The challenge isn't actually to go faster uh, uh, necessarily, but it is to, to reduce the time of travel. So. Let's have a look at uh, some of your answers. There is a 20 second delay, unfortunately, on, uh, on YouTube between, uh, between what, we, uh, what we hear and what we see. So uh, it will take me a little bit of time to see your answers, but I would love to see answers. I'll repeat the question again. How can we, how can we reduce the time it takes for the train to go from one end to another. So, so I'm getting to see some answers coming in, changing it to a better engine, assumption being here that a better engine will make the train go faster. So the concept is making it faster because we can't change distance and we want to decrease time so we can only really increase speed. So you're all right, all of you are correct that we want to increase speed. How can we increase the speed in an, in an innovative way? That's the question. Okay, and so some people will say improve their aerodynamics of the design uh, using superconductor based. I love it. You can see there's a lot of engineers in the uh, in the audience today. Fantastic magnetic levitation. That's great. Great. So because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to share the answer with you and show you the, the movie as well. Uh, 
we are all thinking based on a certain fixedness and fixedness is a really important concept in SIT. I am sure all of you, when I ask you, what is speed teleportation? Thank you, Shanti. That's a, that's a great uh, idea. Uh, if we had the technology for teleportation, we wouldn't actually even need the train, right? We would just teleport the people across. Uh, we can't use a faster route because we are set to the same tracks. The tracks can't be changed. And of course, a lot of these suggestions that, 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 that you are giving us uh, 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 are great for, for what we call marginal improvement or evolutionary improvement, but they're not going to give us revolutionary improvement. So what is the fixedness that's stopping all of us? So surprisingly enough, it's something that we are all, oh, here we go. There's something interesting here. Uh, Vabe Hub Kushik is saying, don't stop the train at stations where tourists are not going or arriving from. Um, so, so we are constrained by warning, uh, by being told by the authorities that we must pick up and release the same number of passengers. Now here's the fix, the fixedness. You know what, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I'm gonna see it yourself and then we'll have a quick chat about how they did that. So I'm gonna do a new share and I am going to share the video of the solution. So this is a prototype Chinese solution to the problem I've just, discuss I've just discussed. So let's have a look. And as you can see here, the train is actually never stopping. It's picking up a carriage that's waiting for it full of people at the station. And it's letting go a carriage that it picked up in the previous station. So the fix that we had, All right, let me do a stop share and bring us back to the deck we were at before. Okay, wonderful. And I'll bring back the YouTube so I can see your comments. All right, so what, we, what actually happened? So the fixness that was broken is something that we're all very much used to. And, the, and this is the idea that um, trains... Okay. Closed. All right. So the fixedness we're all under is that trains must stop at train stations. We're so used to that. We're so used to the structure and the function of the trains that it's very hard for us to think otherwise. And this is one of the, the key elements of, uh, of SIT, and that, and that is to create artificial constraints. What studies have shown is that we are much more creative and innovative, and this is very counterintuitive, intuitive. So all the university studies that have been done on this show that we are much more creative uh, and ultimately innovative when we are under constraints. Think of situations where you were in, in brainstorming sessions and you were told, hey, think of anything you want, do anything you want, there are no constraints. That's actually a lot more difficult. Whereas if you're given constraints, you're placed in the corner and you have to solve those constraints. So, so the, the, the concept of SIT is based on constraints. I'm getting some engineering saying high speeds, it's possible for the carriage, reduce speed. So yes, it's, 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 it's very true. But I want you to, con to think of the concept, think conceptually. I know there's going to always be uh, uh, engineering and, and scientific uh, uh, barriers to get through, but the concept is what's important. The fact that we are able to break our fixedness uh, about the way a, a train should be structured. And you see the fixedness was broken in two ways. One, by dividing the components, by moving a carriage to another level. And two, by subtraction, a, a key feature of SIT. Subtraction is about removing a key component that the system cannot operate without. And in this case, the key component that everybody thought the system could not operate without is stopping at the train station. So by re re removing the ability to stop at the train station, we have to think of a creative way of still letting people in and out. All right, very, very, very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, uh, a little bit about my background. I spent uh, uh, over, over five years uh, heading internal innovation at MDOCS. Uh, I, I think many of you would have heard of MDOCS. Uh, it's, uh, uh, if, if you have heard of MDOCS, just say, uh, say uh, uh, heard, heard, just type in heard, or type in a smiley face if you heard of MDOCS. Uh, so I was their innovation, internal innovation manager, and um, 
for this role, a uh, very interesting role in, in bringing uh, a strategic and tactical innovation throughout an organization of 26,000 people with uh, offices in, in, uh, in nearly 100 uh, cities around the world. And when I left, I went into innovation consulting, running innovation workshops and training. I worked with uh, uh, top companies, as uh, as Gorev suggested, and uh, uh, including uh, including aerospace, banking, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, and uh, and my uh, pleasure is also teaching. I, I teach at uh, I taught MBA courses and still. Um, involved very much in teaching uh, teaching uh, different universities uh, online today, including having taught the Israeli Air Force Innovation Unit as well, which is the uh, the top one of the top innovation military units uh, in Israel during the time that I was uh, based there. So that's a little bit about me. Let's let's jump straight into uh, SIT and uh, give you uh, hopefully some exercises for you to enjoy as well. I can see quite a few have heard of Amdocs, so that's uh, that's good good to see. Uh, uh, India is one of the uh, the largest uh, uh, centers of employment for for Amdocs, and and in Pune there was something like four to five thousand uh, uh, employees uh, in Pune uh, and and uh, uh, other uh, other major cities in, in India. All right, I can see there's still some answers coming in for the train. So, so great ideas, uh, guys. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's move on to the to uh, SIT. So just a few words about the origins. The origins actually, you'd be, you might be surprised, are from Russia, from a, a gentleman by the name of scientist, by the name of Genrich Altschuler, whose system uh, of uh, looking at uh, inventive problem solving became the basis of uh, SIT. And what he discovered whilst a patent, uh, uh, was the patent officer for the Soviet Navy was that Actually, solutions that are creative and that are inventive share a common pattern. If they he found that 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 he subsequent studies confirmed this that eighty percent of creative solutions can be placed into one of five categories. And based on this, Professor Jacob Goldenberg developed the SIT methodology in Israel in the mid-1990s. I had the pleasure uh, and privilege of studying under Professor uh, Goldenberg. We are still in touch and, and, and collaborate on work on projects together. Uh, and I studied under him uh, during my MBA. Uh, he's a very renowned uh, professor, both at Columbia University in the United States and in a number of universities in Israel. So what is the system? that's known as inside the box. Inside the box, not outside the box. Why inside the box? Inside the box, because the idea is that instead of saying, hey, you wanna solve a problem, you wanna invent new products, you wanna invent new services, just think freely with no constraints and it'll just come to you. Well, guess what? It doesn't work that way. As we said, studies have shown uh, and repeated experimentation with these techniques have shown that actually by placing people under constraints, by placing groups with constraints and forcing them to find their way out of that actually encourages them to be a lot more uh, creative. So I recommend the book Inside the Box uh, to anyone who's interested in this methodology. Um, I have my copy here. And get that as uh, as a paperback, and it's been published in, in multiple uh, languages as well. I'm not sure if there's a Hindi copy, but I wouldn't be uh, surprised if there is one as well. Okay, so let's have a quick look at some of the key concepts of uh, of systematic inventive thinking. Any questions so far? By the way, any any questions about anything we discussed? There's again, there's a 20 second delay with YouTube, so I'm going to uh, wait just a little bit to see if any questions pop up. Uh, and then maybe we can take a couple of questions before moving on to the next section. Uh, and I still have a few exercises I want you to do as well. So, so the YouTube time delay is making things a little bit challenging, but uh, this is what we have to deal with and that's what we will. So at the moment, I don't see any questions coming in uh, just yet. Let's just see if, uh, if the 20 second gap has passed. If you do, uh, then, uh, Please, uh, uh, please make them, uh, yeah, 
please put them into chat in YouTube and I'm more than happy to answer. Let's have a quick look at function follows form. So function follows form and form follows function are two uh, very important concepts in SIT. Form follows function is something that you all know about. If you've ever done a uh, 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 business requirements analysis, um, uh, if you've ever had to design anything, if you ever had to solve problems, you would know that form follows function is the usual way to go. What does that mean? It means that that, that what you create, um, what you create is the is based on the requirements that you are asked to, to answer. So for example, if you're an architect and someone asks you to create an appropriate accommodation for a holiday resort on an island, uh, there's a good chance you'll come up with something that looks, looks like this. On the other hand, if you are asked for, uh, for the form uh, that will hold the functionality of, of holding thousands of office workers or hundreds of office workers together, then you will come up with something like this. That's form follow, follows function. Function follows form is the key aspect of SIT and it reverses the normal concept of get your business requirements first and only based on that design your solution. And I'll give you a quick example of function follows form. Function follows form means we take an existing function, an existing product or existing service or existing process, and we start breaking it. We start changing it. So to best way to explain it is we take the form of a bicycle. And obviously, this is a very simple example. We, uh, we can do this in much more complicated examples uh, in, in, in the corporate and, and government world. Uh, let's reduce a wheel. So any thoughts of what you can do with a bicycle with one wheel, this is called subtraction. So we can reduce the wheel, we can turn it obviously into a, a, single, uh, a single wheel bike, or we can replace what we, the component that we subtracted with another component. Okay, so by replacing a subtracted component, that's actually giving us new functionality that didn't exist. If we take away another wheel, we can see that we can create even more function, new functionality. And we change the function from the bike as a transportation device to a lawn mowing device or a fitness device. And that's the power of SIT. It allows you to create new functionality by changing existing form of services and products. I'm gonna have a quick look at the questions, see if I can answer some of your questions. Uh, it's good to see that you, you, you guys are asking questions. Interactive is good. Guys and girls, of course, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the book, so very quickly, what is the book about? Uh, the book is about the methodologies that SIT uses and how to use the methodologies that I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, today. Uh, and gives you lots of business examples. It's together with, uh, written together with Drew Boyd, who was a senior, uh, a senior executive at uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, difference between design thinking and, and innovative thinking. Um, great question, Tejas. Uh, design thinking is a methodology that's got its very own structure about, that's based about customer centricity and needs and trying to understand needs, what the needs of my stakeholders and customers are. Innovative thinking is a generic term that is about how to, uh, how to creatively think in order to create new product services and processes that give value. Triz is the Russian version of the system that SIT is based on. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a com complicated engineering system. SIT simplifies it greatly down to five main methods. Uh, Gorev Anand is asking, I am a fellow learner at Great Learning. Okay, no, that's not it. Uh, would like to know how to develop. All right, so there's gonna be some more questions that Gorev uh, is going to go through and collect for me. So keep those questions coming uh, and uh, we will have a look at them at Q&A. All right, I want to speak to you now about the five templates uh, of the SIT, SIT methodology. There are five main templates, and I want to quickly take you, uh, take you through them in the time that we have. Um, so uh, the first one is subtraction. Now, ironically, a lot of people think that to uh, be innovative, you need to add more and more features to a product or a service. Um, uh, ironically, that's not true. Ironically, what we find is actually by subtracting features and subtract, subtracting key components, we can actually create new innovative product, products and services. Now, this is very counterintuitive because 
as I said before, we always think of additional features as showing that there is additional creativity and innovativeness. This is a phone called the Mango phone. I don't know how many of you have heard of it uh, if, and if whether or not you had it in India. This was popular in the 90s when telephone calls were very very expensive and the idea behind this phone is that parents used to get bill shock when they gave uh, mobile phones to their kids because their kids would speak for hours and calls were timed by the minute uh, and hence it was very uh, uh, very expensive uh, at the end of the month to suddenly receive a bill for the kids conversation so what did what did motorola do motorola with the mango removed a key feature of the phone that is really important. Now, and I would ask you to think, what is, what is the most important key feature of having a, a cell phone? Think of a, of a dumb cell phone. Um, I can see some people are connecting, uh, connecting uh, subtraction to Tris. Very good. Yes, it does follow a similar, a similar concepts as Tris. But very quickly, what is the key function, functionality of, uh, of the uh, of a cell phone that if you remove it, it severely impacts your ability to use that cell phone uh, for the function that you want it. Antenna, antenna is very important, but what I'm looking for is calling, is the ability to make calls, which was correctly identified by Piyush, thank you Piyush, and by, by Shivanch, exactly. So the ability to make a call from the phone was removed. And so you think, well, what's the point of that? But the point is it provided value and innovation is about creating something new that also gives value. What's the value? The value is that uh, the kids, the teenagers could no longer make calls to all their friends. They carry the phone around. There was one number they could still use. Guess what it was apart from emergency numbers. That's right. For those of you who are guessing the number of their uh, of their parents, you're absolutely right. They could still make a call home, but they couldn't call anybody else. And the value was that uh, it became a, uh, a cost-saving way for parents to keep in touch with their, with their children. Um, and, uh, and, and again, most importantly, it was done by removing a key functionality. So, so something to keep in mind, very successful, and it changed the functionality, right? It changed the functionality. It no longer was a normal phone, but it became, uh, the new functionality became a, a device for keeping track of your children. Okay, and I can see the answers are coming in in a slight delay, and you guys are spot on. The ability to make a call, and yes, uh, the ability to, uh, to to call emergency numbers was kept. Some other examples, uh, more more uh, recent examples, is uh, Apple's removal in the iPhone 7 of the headphone jack. So this was removed, uh, uh, subtracted, and uh, allowed the phone to become a lot thinner because the jack was quite thick, uh, and was replaced with wireless headphones. So that's another subtraction example that creates value. Twitter is a great example because what Twitter did is again, something very counterintuitive, right? Instead of giving you more, they're giving you less. They reduced the number of characters that people could type into a message. And this constraint of having less to write with actually proved a great commercial winner. If you, uh, if you are a fan of Mark Twain, the author of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, one of his famous quotes is that it's much more difficult to write a short uh, story or a short letter than it is to write a long one. And that's quite true. Uh, the final example I want to share with you is uh, animal-free meat. I know there's vegetar vegetarianism is is uh, uh, is a big part of the culture in uh, in the Indian subcontinent, and so in this example of uh, meat made in Israel, this meat is made. It's actually meat. It's not a substitute. It's not a vegetarian substitute, uh, but it's known as clean meat because it. Uh, no animals are killed in its creation. It's created from stem cells uh, and it's grown in a laboratory using 1% of the water requirements and having no, uh, uh, no antibiotics or no medicines uh, or because there are no animals to apply that with. So here's another example of subtraction, subtract the animal. Okay, now I have a quiz for you. So uh, have a quick look at the numbers on uh, on board here and tell me uh, the numbers that you can see and tell me which of these numbers uh, uh, one one of these numbers doesn't belong here 
So what is the exception? I know we have a slight time delay, but if you can tell me what is the exception. Now, if you can tell me why you chose that number as well, I know that, that we have plenty of, plenty of engineers here, uh, uh, which means plenty of people who like mathematical quizzes. So tell me why that specific number that you are choosing uh, doesn't belong. So I'm gonna wait for the 20 second, uh, 20 second delay. I can see some interesting comments. You are fans of Tony Stark, says Utam. That's great to hear. Uh, Tony Stark is, is definitely an inspiration for, uh, uh, for, for a lot of people. So what is the number? So I'm getting 19, I'm getting 13. No one is actually telling me why they're choosing the numbers that they're choosing. So it could be a random guess as well. So I would love to, to, to know a little bit about why you're choosing 13. Uh, it seems that most people have chosen 13. Um, and then I will tell you what the answer is. How can an innovative idea be implemented? That's a great question, Kevin. And that's a, that's a, a, a lecture, a, a series of lectures in strategic innovation about implementation. Uh, uh, but, but it's a very important question. A lot, of, a lot of innovation looks purely at uh, only up to the stage of ideation and not at implementation. And strategic innovation, especially the work of Professor Vijay Govindrajan, uh, if you look up, uh, Professor Vijay Govindrajan's work on implementation innovation at uh, the corporate level is very interesting. So I'm getting some answers here, uh, 19, uh, 19 or 13, the product of two numbers, 19, 13, 17. All right, I'm going to tell you what the answer is, and please don't be shocked or surprised. This is the answer. So, so far we had 17, 19, and 13. The answer is two. The number I was looking for is two. Two is the only number that is even. Now, why did no one choose two? The reason you didn't choose two is because you only looked at 17, 19, and 13. This is an example of what our brain does, and that's called functional fixedness. We associate a specific, psychologically, we associate a specific function to, 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 to products, to components, to information that we, that we uh, perceive, and we can't possibly think there could be any other function. What you all did, and, and by the way, that's fine. I, I made this mistake too, and pretty much everybody makes this mistake, is that you ignored one, two, three, because you gave them a function. And that function was a placeholder or a describer. Now, if you look at my question, I was very careful with my question. I didn't say which of the three numbers. I said, which of the numbers on the screen? It was your decision to ignore one, two, and three. Now, what I want you to take away with that lesson is that this is a very simple mathematical uh, uh, example. It's not even that mathematical. Uh, by the way, uh, Himanshu, we see SIT is thinking inside the box, and I'm, I'm going to confirm, confirm that as well. So all of you ignored one, two, three, because you assigned it a function of a placeholder. Uh, and this is teaching us that if this is something that we do, in a simple mathematical quiz like this one, how much do we miss in daily life? How much do we miss in business? How much do we assign the wrong functionality or a fixed functionality to various aspects of our business model or of our product and the components in it that means that we miss end up missing business opportunities, right? So if the business opportunity here was metaphorically represented by two, then pretty much everybody would have missed that business opportunity because nobody thought that two was a player in this business scenario. All right, let's, let's see how that is applied in the next template. And that next template contains, uh, uh, contains uh, this concept of breaking functional uh, and structural fixedness. Um, right. Uh, 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 subra, subramanyam, the idea is function follows form. In other words, we change the form and the new function will, will follow. We saw that in subtraction. Now let's have a look at that. Now let's have a look at that again in, uh, in division. So in division, the idea is that we look at products and services as a combination of components. So products are uh, made up of components, services are made up of steps in various processes. And what we can do is we can rearrange those components to create innovative products and services. What you see on the left with uh, the JBL speaker is the idea that you can take the speakers and structurally remove them from the 
music source. So by doing that, you're creating value by having portable speakers. If any of you remember this from your university days, I had one of these in the 90s, and it allows you to remove the face from the head of the uh, tape tape machine uh, of the CD player uh, uh, to stop to stop it from being stolen. Uh, and that's breaking the the, the composition uh, of uh, of products and to create value. And finally, in this picture here, you can see that uh, what was happening is that the component of uh, of uh, controlling the boat was moved from the boat to the handle of the water skier, uh, creating innovative value by reducing the size of the boat. And, uh, and meaning that you can water ski just by yourself. Of course, there's a problem, a uh, potential problem if the boat uh, runs away from you, but they solve that technologically as well. All right, uh, I want to speak very quickly about another kind of division, and that division is time-based division. We see that in IKEA. IKEA were pioneers and, uh, uh, and uh, greatly exploited this concept of time-based division. Uh, and what was, what was moved? What component was moved? The, what IKEA did is they moved the assembly of the furniture from the beginning of the process to the end of the process. So, so division isn't just about moving components around in space. It's also about moving steps in time. We see that a lot in prepayments, where payment has moved from the end of a process to the beginning of the process, creating value. IKEA have utilized that as well to create value for its customers and for itself. Let's do a very quick uh, exercise in the little bit of time we have left. So uh, I know there's probably a lot of engineers here. Have a look at the, these, uh, uh, these two pictures. They're both pictures of light bulb uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the light being changed in a uh, street lamp. And my question to you is, uh, look at that. Almost 100 years have changed between between these uh, uh, two photos, and yet both require uh, a way of getting to the top in order to fix uh, the source of light. Um, and my question to you is, how would you redesign the common street street lamp in such a way that the engineer doesn't need to go up there all the time. And this is to break structural fixedness. This is to break the fixedness that says that, that components need to be in a specific position and in a specific structure. So the question again, how would you redesign the street lamp breaking structural fixedness, breaking the fixedness that says that, that components need to be in a certain position uh, uh, in order to make it easier? Um, Solar charge is great. Uh, for solar charge, I would need to, to bring in new components. Uh, but you're right, that would solve, that would solve uh, the problem. Not the answer I was looking for, but that's, but that's a good answer. Bring the lamp set down. Fantastic. Nanda, usually it takes a long time for people to get that. Um, so a lot of people say telescoping pole. People say uh, use a series of ropes to be able to bring the bulb up and down. But, uh, but I think... I think quite a few of you have got that already. The idea, actually, the solution is to bring the lamp set up down, but keep it down permanently, and then use mirrors to bring the light back up. So once the lamp is based in the ground uh, and protected, it can easily be accessed. You don't need a uh, uh, you don't need a way of getting up to the top. Uh, you can ch fix the lamp at the bottom, and mirrors will bring the the image back up. Now, there's lots of questions. I wish I could answer all the questions. As I said, Gaurav will pick some of these uh, for, for me to answer shortly. Um, but, uh, uh, but great, great to see, great to see how you're understanding, you're understanding the concept of division. Let's have a quick look at the third out of the five concepts in SIT. Again, please remember that I'm running through these at, 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 at breath at taking speed, there's obviously a lot more. When we teach this in Columbia University, we teach this over two and a half months, uh, giving, uh, giving an entire week to two weeks for each one of these uh, methodologies. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Multiplication is a great idea. What multiplication uh, uh, can do is as follows. Multiplication looks for a key component in your product or service and copies it, making a change to one of its attributes. So the, 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 the story behind Febreze noticeables was that uh, uh, Febreze came out with uh, uh, this product uh, uh, of air fresheners in bathrooms. And 
uh, this uh, uh, this this question is uh, uh, this product proved to be problematic because people started complaining that it wasn't working. The reason people complained that the air freshener wasn't working is very simple. Uh, anatomically, our nose is very quickly adjusted to smells, and after a while, people could no longer smell the perfume that was being sprayed by the air freshener. So what did what did Febreze do? What Febreze did is they took the perfume and they copied it. So there were two valves, two containers of perfume inside the product, and they would switch every spray, every 15, 20 minutes, they would switch between the sprays. So the nose never got used to the idea, to the, to the, to the smell, and, uh, and each time was being challenged by, by a change in the smell. So multiplication is very powerful. Uh, I'm giving you very simple examples, but of course you can apply them to your business. Uh, this is another very simple example. You probably remember this pen from the 80s, or maybe you, some of you have, a, a, have an old, uh, old pen uh, of these lying around. What was done here? They've taken a main component. What's a main component of the pen that the pen will not work without? It is the ink, the ink and the ink container. And that was copied, but it's not enough to copy. You have to make a change to a key attribute. And what's a key attribute of the ink? Well, without a doubt, it's color. I mean, there are other attributes such as uh, uh, the thickness of the ink, uh, uh, how much it flows, how concentrated it is, how much the density of it is, etc. But the key one that we're concerned with is color. And so the ink was copied multiple times and each time a color was changed. That's an example of multiplication. Another example for those of you who are more, more uh, tech, tech minded is this concept of two factor authentication. So the need to enter a password as a step was multiplied. So it was copied. Um, so instead of just entering a phone number, the designer said, let's copy a requirement for a password, but let's change the way that that password needs to be needs to be entered. Let's change the information we're asking for. So this is an, a great technological example of multiplication of multiplying a step uh, by changing a key attribute. That key attribute is the way that the password is entered into the system. Um, there is a question about whether SIT is a reconstructionist approach. I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Maybe you want to expand on that uh, and I'm happy to try and answer that. Let's, uh, we're doing well with time. We have about 10 minutes left for until we do uh, Q and A. And so hopefully we'll be able to run through these uh, uh, for you any additional questions you have. All right, so the fourth out of the five templates is task unification. I love this, this methodology because what this methodology does, and it's great for, for developing products and services uh, under, under constraints, is to get more out of what you currently have. Uh, and what this is, is as follows. The, what you're seeing here is a special glove that was designed, uh, albeit a good 15 years ago, but back in the days before, uh, before Bluetooth, was uh, uh, was very uh, uh, advanced, and what it did is it allowed people in very cold climates to uh, uh, not only wear their gloves, but what they found is that by the time they took their gloves off, they were too late in hitting the the button on the on the phone to receive a call. So the functionality for the call was moved onto the glove, and you can see that right there. So so. You could answer a call, you can uh, read out, it had some very basic functionality and it was built in into the glove and you can see the glove also functioned, functioned as a way uh, uh, in a natural, in a natural way uh, as a way of, uh, of a phone as well. Um, multiple USB slots to a PC can be multiplication. I'll quickly answer that only if the slots are different from one another. So multiplication isn't just copying. Multiplication is making a change. So multiple USB slots are not an example of multiplication unless there is an attribute that, that you change in them. For example, uh, um, the technology type of USB is different for each slot, uh, then you would say it's multiplication. But of course, that has to have value in it. Uh, here's another example. It's called the play pump, and it's an example from South Africa. What they found, uh, what they found is that they wanted to create a way for for uh, the women of the village not to have to uh, uh, have to use 
difficult and 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 hand operated pumps so what they did is they created a merry-go-round playground for children and as the children used the merry-go-round that actually activated a pump that would pump water into a water tower and then the women of the village would come and they would use that to um uh, uh, use 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 the uh, be able to take the water from a tap without having to hand pump. So this is a great example of task unification because it takes an existing task, existing task without destroying its functionality, uh, and that task is the children playing, uh, and it creates additional value from that by creating a new a new task. Unfortunately, to give you a, a spoiler, ultimately this methodology, whilst it was uh, heavily promoted by the United Nations in third world countries, such as uh, uh, such as found in Africa and in South Africa itself, didn't work, uh, mainly because at some point the women started forcing the kids to play. And even when the kids didn't want to play, they were being forced to play uh, so that the pump would work. And of course, we know that once you tell kids that they have to do something, that's the last thing they want to do. Uh, so that's that was the failing point. And of course, it, sometimes it worked too well, pumping out all the water out of the reserve too quickly and leaving no water in there. Uh, great, another great example uh, was that didn't succeed, but it's a great idea, is the fuse card. And the idea of the fuse card was to place all the different, all your different electronic cards and key cards, uh, your, your, your transportation card, your banking card, your phone cards, everything that you had as cards onto a single card that would work with, uh, with all the different systems. Uh, and this was a great idea. It, it, got, uh, uh, it got a lot of traction. You could probably still find, find examples. I can see some reactions coming into South African example that I discussed. Uh, people are finding that funny. It, it's funny. It is kind of funny and ironic because it's some of the things you don't think about in innovation, right? You don't think about uh, the human factor enough. You don't do design thinking, for example, to understand the needs, the needs of the stakeholders and the children obviously are a main stakeholder in the previous example. So the fuse card, great idea. Uh, uh, you can look you can look it up more on, on YouTube. The problem with the fuse card ultimately failed, not because the idea wasn't good, but simply because they didn't get their security right. So security was a big issue. They couldn't get it right and, and the concept failed. But as a concept, it's a very good concept. All right, we have about five and a half minutes. I want to take you through what I think is one of the most powerful tools in SIT, and this is the tool of attribute dependency. So if until now we were looking at components and how we can either remove or subtract components, how can we move them around using division, how can we multiply and use a multiplication, how we can reuse them for new functionality using attribute dependency, I will now want to show you a, a, a really powerful uh, and quite revolutionary method of, of very, uh, that allows you very fast innovation development. And this method of SIT is called attribute dependency. Now, why am I showing you a chameleon? I'm showing you a chameleon because for, for a couple of reasons, but, but the, the, the background to me showing you a chameleon is to do with uh, Stanford a Stanford lab, and there's labs like this now in all over universities in, in the United States. I did a, one of my innovation courses was at Stanford. And what Stanford excels at is a concept known as biomimicry. So for those of you who have heard of biomimicry, the idea of biomimicry is that we look at nature and we imitate examples of uh, of how nature solves problems in order to create innovative solutions. And, uh, and this is a great example from nature because what we see here is that the chameleon's attribute of color of its skin changes based on the attribute of the color of the environment, right? So there's a relationship there. Can we find examples for that in a commercial sense? So I don't know if you if you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, remember back, back in the 90s, there was a very famous case of a woman suing McDonald's for a, a, a boiling, a, a, a very, very highly boiling cup of coffee, which she ended up spilling on herself. By the way, it was contributory negligence for anyone who's interested in the law. She actually put it between the cup between her legs as she drove off from the car park and then she breaks suddenly and the coffee spilled all over her legs causing her second degree burns. So um, what this company designed uh, in response is a coffee, a disposable coffee cup where the lid 
changes color based on whether it's safe or not to drink the liquid inside. So for example, if the coffee or the tea or the chai is boiling, uh, is boiling hot, the, 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 the lid will be a red color. Once it goes down to a safe level to drink, we can drink our chai safely. We know that because the cap is now of a brown color. So that's a great example of attribute dependency. And we can plot that uh, using this attribute matrix. And this is actually how we create new dependencies using attribute dependency. I can plot various attributes like the color of the lid, the cost of the item, uh, the age of the customer. I can plot the size of the cup, the temperature of the liquid inside. Um, and I can, what I will do is I will first of all plot what is the reality. So at the moment when you buy a takeaway chai or a takeaway coffee from a shop, I'm pretty sure that the color of the lid doesn't change based on how hot the liquid is. So if that's the case, you would put zero, there is no change. And then you would go through every combination and map out whether uh, it is, um, whether it is uh, uh, dependent or not. For example, does the temperature of the liquid affect the color of the lid? The answer is clearly not. And you will go through, does the age of the customer affect the size of the cup? Well, actually in some, in some jurisdictions, like in New York, they did that. They made a, uh, a rule that uh, uh, at, at, uh, uh, for, for, for fast, fast drinks, you're not able to get uh, very large cups, for example, because they have a problem with obesity, with overweightness of, of people using funny, uh, of using uh, drinks, uh, very sweetened drinks. So what I then do is I go through and I change all my zeros to one. So where there is no dependency, I will create dependency. So my chai, now, when I drink my chai, I will no longer burn my lips because I will see that it is, um, it is uh, the, the, the lid will tell me the temperature of the liquid. Okay, so I can go through and I can decide whether to, to create or remove dependencies. And that's exactly what we round up. We have a couple of minutes to round up. Samoa Air tried to do that by creating a dependency between the weight of the passengers, they have a big overweight problem in Samoa, and the cost. They made the airline ticket cost per kilo, which is great for families with uh, small children uh, and skinny people, but it wasn't so great for all the overweight people in Samoa. And uh, what happened was that uh, it was uh, kicked out, uh, of uh, it was ruled illegal by the Supreme Court of, uh, of Samoa. So just because something is innovative doesn't mean it's legal. In Tokyo, uh, uh, this was uh, uh, this attribute dependency was applied by Tokyo clubs. Now, some of you will probably think this is quite sexist, but remember this is uh, 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 from a, a Japanese nightclub. And the idea here is that the taller the heel on the shoe of the lady customers, the greater discounts they will receive for cocktails and alcoholic drinks. And of course, the idea here is to uh, encourage, uh, encourage lady visitors to wear high heels, and so there will be more men. Now, you can say that's pretty crazy, uh, but that was actually a, a real example from Tokyo of attribute dependency. So once again, the attribute of the height of the component called shoe, right, uh, influences the attribute of cost of the component called price. And I want to give you a final example before we round up. And I love this example. This example is from, uh, from uh, uh, Moscow. I was born in Russia. My background is actually from Russia before my parents immigrated to Australia. And this is, comes from a startup in Moscow. And this is what they did. They brought, if normally we see the internet, the digital world reflecting the physical world, here they went the other way around. They had the physical world reflecting the digital world. So what they did is they placed little cameras connected to computer systems and algorithms on the, on the worldwide net uh, at billboards, and they would scan the cars that are, that, are being, uh, uh, that are coming towards the billboard on the highway. And then based on the model and the age of the cars that was, uh, that was found, they then displayed advertising that matches the type of car. So if a lot of old cars were coming, they would display McDonald's and, and, and shampoo. If expensive, expensive uh, uh, oligarch cars would come towards them, they would display diamonds, 
and uh, holidays. So, and of course that advertising was being sold uh, uh, in real time. So that's a very powerful idea. And what I want you to do, I'm going to give you a take home exercise before we finish. Uh, I would love to do this exercise with you, but there's a, a lot of you. This will, if you do this exercise, you will then be able to apply it to any product or service that you're currently working with. And this is the power of SIT. It allows you to, to start applying this immediately. What I want you to do is pick a sport that you like, probably you're gonna choose cricket, but you can, you can pick any sport that you want. Uh, if you don't like sport, you can pick opera or a rock concert. And I want you to, in your spare time, when after we finish this uh, webinar, I want you to do a two-dimensional matrix of the attributes of the sport or of the cultural events. And then ask yourself, is there a dependency, in which case it's one, and if there's no dependency, make it zero and then go around and turn your zeros to one and your ones to zero. So create a dependency where there isn't one. You can even do that. That, that would be enough. Create dependencies and you can actually reinvent the game of cricket. You can reinvent what an opera looks like, what a rock concert looks like, uh, what a soccer uh, match would look like and uh, gives you a lot, a lot of fun uh, to play with that. It's probably enough to do a five by five or a six by six matrix. Uh, that will allow you to understand how attribute dependency works. And then once you've understood that, you can start applying that to your own products and services. Okay, I think we are good. Um, uh, this is a recap of the five templates. So remember, we're talking about subtraction, division, multiplication, task unification, and attribute dependency, uh, and uh, all very powerful me methodologies. Thank you very, very much. I'm more than happy to take uh, questions. Uh, Gorev, we said uh, we said that you will come and uh, sure. and and share some questions with me. Sure. So I'm going to do a stop share. Thank you so much. And we're back. Wonderful. So it was a bit. It was a, it was very fast. I, I, I remember this is a two and a half month course that we teach at Columbia University. Uh, so we did have to run quite fast. But uh, if anyone is interested, I'm sure Gorev can give you additional information of how you can do this course sure. with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie. Uh, that was really insightful. Uh, you know, taking us through the five templates, I think uh, very useful and insightful. So there are quite a few questions actually. Let me start from the top. Um, yeah, the first question, there are actually two similar questions. So I'm gonna ask both of them together. The first one is Tejas Phase. He's asking, what is the difference between design thinking and innovative thinking? And uh, Nana uh, Raginwar has asked a similar question. What is the difference between design thinking and systematic um, innovative thinking. Okay, so the first the first question I actually answered uh, during the talk, but I'll quickly repeat it. The answer is that uh, uh, design thinking is a systematic set of tools with a process uh, of how to come up with innovative products and services by better understanding the needs of customers. So design thinking is all about customer centricity and empathy. It's an example. Uh, of a uh, of a leading set of tools that use innovative thinking. Uh, difference between SIT and design thinking is that SIT is quick win. SIT you can get to ideas within within half an hour. Half an hour to an hour, I can sit down with a group of, of executives and I do that, and we can come up with inventive ideas. The catch, of course, is that it's not enough for you to have creative ideas. You still have to check whether the idea is feasible, whether there is a market for it, whether, whether it's financially viable. So, so the real win worth it gateways of MIT's design thinking that says it's not enough to be creative. You have to have a, a, you have to have a real need, you have to be able to beat your competition and you have to be financially viable. That will apply to SIT afterwards. So in a sense, it turns the order. Design thinking takes longer to reach to find what the product is, but you know that it's based on real customer needs. Whereas SIT gets you there very quickly, but then you have to go and check that it meets real customer needs. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Ilan. Uh, there is another question from Sumitra Ray, uh, and um, the question is, for inside the box thinking, do you think basic is the main thing which should be measured as these may be dynamic also? Basic? Should be measured? Yes. What's the what should be measured? Is that the question? I don't quite understand. Let, let me uh, repeat that question. I think the question here is for inside box thinking, do you think yes. is the main thing which should be measured as these may be dynamic as well? 
I think this is. Uh, okay, I'm not sure what the question means, but I will quickly talk about measurement. Measurement is super important in innovation management. Uh, uh, in terms of what you want to measure uh, with SIT, it's not different from what you want to measure with any other innovation tools, and that's uh, uh, the percentage of ideas that actually go into uh, into shortlisting and go into incubation. You want to, uh, uh, and, and then you want the measurements you want to do is, is for feasibility and viability to see whether it's financially viable and whether it's technologically feasible. That would be the main measures. Sure. Um, the other question here is, uh, and this one is from Krishna Bhargav, uh, how to test the effectiveness or the flaws of your design? Well, that's, that's an entire lecture uh, altogether. But the main thing that we do is we list assumptions about our design so we can test those assumptions in the market. We then do what's known as validation. And design doesn't have to be just for, um, just for products. And so I just want to quickly share a book. This is a book I strongly recommend, The Lean Startup. The Lean Startup is the answer to your question. Uh, uh, to that question. Basically, it's about validation and iterative validation. So test, learn, change, and then test, learn, change. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing circle or triangle as it's represented in this book. Uh, and, and the bottom line is validation, iterative validation. And minimum viable product, of course, is, is crucial. Create a minimal viable product and then iteratively test that, improving it step by step. Don't wait to test to test your product uh, till the very end of your design. Test test as quickly as possible. Validate as early as possible. Go sure. ahead. Sure. Um, the other question that has come in is Rajesh Barrier. He's asking, how do you cultivate innovation culture? Within oh my God. So for that, they will have to join uh, uh, our, uh, our next lecture on cultivating innovation culture, which is where I sign up six years of, almost six years of experience doing just that at MDocs. The bottom line to give you to, to something that, that I could speak about uh, and teach uh, for, 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 for over a two, two month course is you have to uh, create an infrastructure for innovation. You have to use the right systems, have the right roles and responsibilities on the one side to create grassroots innovation ideas. And you also have to have, and that's known as bottom up innovation. And your top-down innovation means you have to have senior management on board, putting money into internal uh, uh, VC, uh, uh, internal VC fund uh, for uh, for that, and giving the message uh, and the structure for importance of innovation. This is what innovation management is. It's a, it's an entire topic of of, uh, of study. Very hard to answer in, in a single sentence, but that's the gist of it. Sure. Happy to answer thank some more questions, you. Gaurav. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Eli, there's another question, and this is this one is from Subramaniam Gargia. Uh, so he says we talk uh, we talk about reconstru uh, reconstructionalist approach and structuralist approach when we speak about structure and system. How is form follows function or or vice versa different from it? And then he's also elaborated on his question by saying regarding reconstructionalist approach developing systems over existing infrastructure. Okay, so that's taking us taking us a little bit into into uh, 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 into the uh, into a philosophical or uh, uh, or a definitional concept of, of uh, reconstruction. I guess what I would say is that uh, uh, the best way to answer that is SIT is based entirely on the ability to break down products, services, and systems into its components. So. Uh, 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 so, so the deconstruction is at the level of being able to see that whatever it is that you're working with, an organization, a product, a service, a process, everything is just a combination of components or steps. Once you understand that and mm -hmm. you understand that you are bound by fixedness that doesn't allow you to see a new function for an existing step and doesn't allow you to think of a, of, a, of, a, of a component being in a different place, if you can break that, and this is what SIT teaches, how to break that uh, fixedness, then in a sense, you could argue you're doing reconstruction because you are, you, are then, you are then reconfiguring your product or your service in a new way to create new functionality and new value. And this is the concept of function follows form. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Another question, uh, again, from uh, Subramaniam Gargia. 
uh, how SIT inculcates contingency approach? Okay, so it's it's very hard to answer without some follow up uh, 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 from him to find out what he means by that. Uh, what specifically? Everyone has their own definition of contingency approach. SIT allows you to define challenges and to seek solutions to those challenges. So those challenges are agnostic to industry and they're agnostic to challenge. So if you wanted to, for example, let's take the current COVID crisis as an example. Uh, uh, I could take a service and I would say, what happens if in that service, for example, a restaurant service, I, I, I can't have customers coming in to the restaurant. So I subtract customers, I subtract visiting customers, or I subtract diners from that. That artificially creates a constraint. Now, of course, if I do it after the COVID crisis, it's not artificial because I'm reflecting reality. But the idea of SIT is to do it before the crisis. And this is what contingency planning is. So I can use SIT to subtract key crucial features from my system. For example, uh, the, 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 the safety airbag of a car, let's say that doesn't work. Okay, let's say that fails. And so the person could potentially have an accident. So I could say in the contingency, what happens if that fails? Let's subtract that component and then see how, what else we can do as a fail safe, as a plan B to ensure that the driver is still safe. So we can use SIT very strongly to come up with different scenario, future scenarios uh, based on the way we manipulate our current services and products. Got it. Thank you, Eli. Um, so we are a little over the our scheduled hour. Um, thank you so much, Eli. Uh, thank you so much for your time. This has been a very inspiring and insightful session. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, and Great Learning Corporate Academy will be back with another webinar next week. Thank you so much for your time. It was uh, a pleasure to host you today. My, my, my pleasure, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Gurv. And, and are, you, are we making the, the PDFs available? Are we making this video? Is this video going to be recorded and available to people who missed it? Yes, this, uh, the recording of this particular video, the recording link will be shared with all the registered participants. Okay, and the PDFs are going to be shared as well, if they want? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So I, on behalf, uh, on behalf of Great Learning, I want to uh, uh, thank them for uh, uh, inviting me um, for, for the session. And uh, it was uh, very, very informative for me to see the engagement from, uh, from the audience. So I thank everyone for engaging and for answering the quizzes and for asking your questions. Uh, and uh, I look forward to meeting, meeting you again in future future engagements. Thank you, Gora, very much for inviting me and we will uh, speak soon. Thank you so much, Eddie. It was a pleasure. Have a good Bye-bye. Bye-bye.